welcome to the Ghost of Harren Hall. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 213 of our chapter by chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George Martin. Today we'll be discussing chapter 69 of A Storm of Swords. That's John 9. As always, we're going to chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you. Hopefully we're going to provide you some entertainment along the way. We will summarise what happened, discuss our thoughts on it, provide some useful background, compare it to the television show, indulge in a little pedantry, and cover some relevant news and listener correspondence. Be sure to check out the show notes. They'll provide some additional information about the characters and geography of this chapter. How are you, McKelly? I'm doing well. I'm a bit tired. It's it's nearly 8 o'clock our time. It, this is so late. I am sorry. I've had <laughs> nah. a very busy day. It's my fault. I hear you. But I have some interesting banter for you. So last week, just last week, you asked me if I'd heard of a writer called Hugh Howie. And I said, nah, never heard of him. Right. He he wrote something Lena Headey is starring in, right? That's why you mentioned him. Exactly. Silo something. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the middle of the book. I'm (laughs) halfway through the book. I was halfway through the book when you asked that question. And I said, no, never heard of him. (laughs) <laughs> you were halfway through that book? No, not the Lena Haiti one, but he 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 wrote the the books that the show Silo is based on, which Oh, is, yeah. Um, so I guess it's not called Silo something. That's the other series that's he the does. Other one. But I'm reading the Silo books, which weirdly oh. is called Wool, as in the the fur of a sheep. Like W O O L. <laughs> exactly that word, yeah. Um but I'd never noticed who was writing it. I mean, <laughs> it's, <laughs> I just never looked at the author's name. And so when you said it, it meant nothing to me. And then I just happened to notice. I was like, oh, that sounds yes. familiar. I actually have heard of this author. Mm-hmm. You know, I've noticed because I do most of my reading on e-readers these days. Well, my one, my iPad e-reader. Um, I don't always know the author of who I'm reading because I never see the cover of the book. Exactly. That's what it was. It's. It's. I, I'm actually listening to that book, and so I'd never ever noticed the, uh, the title of the the, the, author yeah. of the book. Authors need to uh, do something about that. Maybe maybe have their wor- their name piped in like every yeah. uh, <laughs> once every chapter. Product placement. You know, yeah, George Martin. <laughs> um, so I have another story from England. If you're ready for another story from England. I am. At some point, you have to tell me why you're wearing it. What looks like a giant anaconda. Well, around that, your neck. that's number that's number two on the list of things I'm going to talk about. Okay. Okay. So okay. The story from England is that um, while we were gone, so only me and Carson went. We left Lucas at home, and um, at four a.m. English time, my phone rang. Oh boy! Now you know me. You know how how much I care about my phone and how close it is to me at all times. <laughs> it was in another, probably in your suitcase still. <laughs> it was the other side of the house. So it woke uh-huh. everybody in the house up, but not me. But you, right. <laughs> I was fast asleep, didn't care at all. <laughs> so eventually my brother staggers into my bedroom and says, phone, and sort of throws me the phone. And it's Lucas in a panic because he's lost his wallet. Oh no. And okay. so, I mean... I have some sympathy, but at the same time, have you forgotten the time difference? It's right. 4 a.m. where we are. But And so, what are you supposed to do about it from across the Atlantic Ocean? Thank you, McKelly. Thank you. <laughs> These are the points I made to Lucas. He was not very happy with me. Us but, dads have to stick together like that. Yeah. The funny part of the story was that my brother, as we've mentioned before, does sound quite a lot like me. He does. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When he answered the phone to Lucas, Lucas laid into him like he was his father. Rob, my brother, now alerted to how my son treats me. (laughs) He said, he said, and I, I, I like to imagine he said it in the Star Wars way. He said, Luke, I am not your father. <laughs> but um, at the day after, I only learned all this the day after when we were all talking about it. But my brother then kept on, he had different punchlines for this. One of them was Lucas saying, oh, thank God, I always suspected. <laughs> 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 Which is quite funny. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Rob is a is a clever man. Mm-hmm. Very clever with his jokes. Yeah. So it, it all worked out. We cancelled the credit cards and nothing nothing was lost. But apart from sleep, which was lost right. in yes. the the household. 
Uh huh. Why am I wearing hot beans around my neck? Is that what that is? Okay. Is it, yeah, they're they're like it's like a tube of microwavable uh, seeds that sort of it, give you sort of. It looks like a snake. It looks like, like a snake. Yeah, it's yes. not a snake. Um, I've recovered from my torn hamstring and I'm playing soccer again. Yay! Oh, uh, yeah. Well, you've recovered from one injury. Uh-huh. Based on so, the snake around your neck, I'm guessing <laughs> there's something else going on now. My my first game back, I was hit in a train wreck tackle. I mean, like, I, I, I literally have no recollection of how anything happened. I just remembered I was running as fast as I could. And then I remember I was hitting the ground. Now, when you're running fast and you hit the ground, you might expect to skid a little bit, but all of my momentum was turned from the horizontal to the vertical. So I just oh. hit the ground and stopped dead. Oh. So I landed directly on my right shoulder and my head snapped down and hit the floor as well over oh, my goodness. right shoulder. And so my my collarbone snapped into the middle. So I'm bruised where my collarbone hits my throat. Oh my goodness. And even my other collarbone not the one i landed on but the other one is bruised as well wow yeah i lay on the sideline in fetal position for about 15 minutes they just and carry you over to the sideline and keep they just, playing. Yeah. i actually yeah. got up and walked but as soon as i got there i lay back down again it was it was i i've never felt so rough from a tackle i thought I thought I was going to throw up and I thought I needed... I almost fell asleep. I, I closed my oh, eyes and I wow. almost fell asleep. So you think it was a concussion? I don't think my head really hit the ground. No, I mean, I yeah. think it reached the ground, but I don't think it was a bad bang. But just just what I did to my bones. So Monday, I couldn't... That was Saturday. Sunday, I didn't feel great. Monday, I still couldn't really sit up straight or stand or anything. So I went to a chiropractor. Oh, your your favorite kind of doctor. Uh well, I don't like to I don't like to alienate any of our listeners, but I have had some cynical, skeptical things to say about chiropractors in the past. But I went to see Carson said, So how did you find this chiropractor? I was like, he was the nearest one to my office. <laughs> Great qualifications right there. That's what I was looking for. And and he didn't have a waiting list. <laughs> <laughs> might not be a great qualification except for that you need him quickly uh-huh. and he uh, he was a big fella tattoos and he uh he threw me around like a rag doll <laughs> <laughs> you sure this was a licensed chiropractor <laughs> i was surprised when he gave me the cope <laughs> <laughs> absolutely cured me i mean i went from being the worst i've ever felt to being totally fine still it's like four days later i've still got a sore neck but otherwise i am completely healed it was an absolute miracle wow i take it all back i feel terrible now yeah (laughs) for saying all the things i've said and thinking all the things i've thought (laughs) and there you go you've you were speaking without necessarily having a ton of personal experience. Good point. Exactly. Exactly. And now you do. And, and you're just... still not sure whether that was an actual chiropractor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. When The first time he snapped my neck, I said to him, doesn't it scare you to do that to a person? He I said, would think it would. <laughs> it did the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gets easier as you do it. <laughs> When the first guy got up and walked, I felt better about it. <laughs> yeah, so that's scary. That's, <laughs> that's that's what I've been up to. All right, good stuff. You've been you have been busy. Yeah. Well, we are running long. I guess we should do yes. what you. Uh... Let's get down to business then. How did we leave Jon Snow? Last we saw of Jon, he was fighting to defend the wall from a wildling invasion. It was hard work and the Night's Watch were horribly outmanned, but the wall is a sizable advantage. That uh, it is. They repelled the wildling attack fairly easily, but paid a price, losing acting commander Donald Noy. Maester Eamon tapped Jon as the next man up to lead at Castle Black. McKelly, why don't we give a summary of this one? All right. Jon is awoken by Owen at dawn. He's not ready to wake up, but the war won't wait. Relentless attacks from the wildlings have sapped the energy of the defenders on the wall. 
Pip's gallows humor keeps them going, but the long hours, danger, and senseless slaughter that they're inflicting on the invaders have left them all feeling exhausted. They've been watching a new strategy build over the last few days. A device they've dubbed the Turtle has been crafted by Mance Raider's people. It's a wheeled shield to protect multiple attackers at the gate. For now, John watches as the wildlings rouse, fires lit and arrows fired at the wall. The archers hide behind mantlets. They were previously repelled by fire arrows, but the wildlings always adapt, and now the shields are covered in raw, wet hides that won't burn. Pip has named the straw sentinels along the wall, and a game is being held to see which gets hit the most often. Using Eamon's Myrish glass, John is able to make out Mance's woman, Dala, ready to give birth at any moment. He surveys the turtle. It will come today. John insists that Gren get some sleep. He'll be needed when the fighting recommences. John spies some old friends in the wildling throng, like Tormund Giantsbane and Vermeer Sixskins, although Vermeer wasn't much of a friend. No. <laughs> Hob, ar- <laughs> Hob arrives with breakfast, and John's appetite is gone. This... No. Sorry, your little name there threw me off. Sorry. Hob arrives with breakfast, but John's appetite is gone. The situation I'm always, is I'm always dire. thinking about when our when our writings are sort of like inducted into sort of like the, the libraries of Congress. Right, and yeah. I gotta fix the typos, you know. <laughs> Good idea. It would be it would be embarrassing otherwise. We yeah. look so unprofessional. <laughs> The situation is getting dire, and I don't just mean our writing. Uh, There's no more oil, pitch, and they're running low of arrows. On top of that, news came from the west that Bowen Marsh has chased the wildlings all the way to the Bridge of Skulls and defeated the force of 300 wildlings, but 100 Night's Watch brothers also perished in the fight. On learning this news, John sent Zay to Molestown to plead for help. She never came back, and when another brother was sent to find her, he reported that the whole town was deserted. The turtle begins to trundle forward, and arrows do nothing against it. Fire arrows are also defeated by the fresh mammoth hides that cover the surface. Their wetness snuff out the flames. John's prepared, though. Barrels have been filled with water and stones, frozen overnight. They can be pushed off the wall when the turtle arrives. Not much can pierce it, but a hundred pounds of solid ice and rock will put a dent in just about anything. No mammoths come, John's glad of that. They die horribly. The scorpions and catapults can't slow the turtle. When it reaches the wall, it takes three men to drop each barrel, but they have the desired effect. The wildlings abandon their redoubt. A momentary victory, but they only have eight barrels left and the wildlings will be back. John leaves Pip in charge to Gren and Pip's amazement. John takes a cup of dream wine and sleeps in his own little bedchamber. He wakes to find four unfamiliar brothers standing over him. They know his name and order him to come with them. They march him up to Mormont's chambers, where he finds Maester Eamon, Septon Celador, Winton Stout, Alisa Thorne, and some strangers. Thorne immediately accuses John of being a turncloak. We shall see, says the jowly man sitting in Mormont's seat. John wants none of this nonsense and asks how many men Thorne has brought, but the nonsense is just beginning. That it is. As John always feared, his actions north of the wall are thrown back at him. Abandoned his brothers, took up with the wildlings, slept with Egret, murdered Corin. Maester Eamon contends that he and Noy considered all of this and concluded that John was innocent. But it all sounds pretty bad to Thorn. John explains the truth, that the half-hand, hey, I did it, (laughs) <laughs> no Hoffhan <laughs> was was worried that Mance would find the Horned of Winter, but Sir Alistair scoffs at the idea. The Jolly Man reveals himself to be Janus Slint, who is claiming command here at Castle Black. Did Corrin Halfhan command him to sleep with the wildlings? No, he commanded not to balk at anything. But he cannot deny that he went beyond that, that he really cared for her. Slint sees this as the admission they sought. Oathbreaker. John passionately insists that he never turned cloak, never took up arms for the wildlings, and escaped as soon as he could. But his accusers have a witness. They bring in Rattleshirt, almost unrecognisable without his armour. His testimony is damning. That Ghost attacked Corin Halfhand, who swore he'd see Craven John dead, and that John slit his throat to save himself. John now knows he's in trouble. Indeed. 
Slint gets angry and reveals his true feelings. John is a Stark, and Slint knows their perfidy. And a bastard to boot. The Septon piles in. He wouldn't say his vows in the Sept. He went north of the Wall to be with the Wildling gods. Aemon again objects and asserts John's bravery in protecting Castle Black. Slint ignores. Starks are traitors. Robert wasn't even cold when Ned reached for the throne. He died at the sword, as befits a highborn, but a noose is enough for John. Thorne grabs John to take him away, and John grasps Sir Alistair's throat. He's pulled off by the other men, and Thorne opines that he truly is a wildling. Yep. So, I will say, I was all prepared to be a, a little bit bored again by another John chapter where shooting fish in a barrel from the <laughs> wall. <laughs> right. Uh, no discredit to George Martin's battle descriptions, which are excellent. It's just been going on for a while, and it's hard to be that invested when the results seem to be a foregone conclusion, and there are more logical conclusions for the whole thing. You know, there are better things that could be happening. But the rearrival of Thorn and the arrival of Slint have given this a whole new momentum. This is it. Really stuff. has, yeah, the, yeah. Like halfway through the chapter, you're like, okay, they repelled another attack, yeah. right? <laughs> One more <laughs> dream, wine, sleep, and then back to the wall for some more throwing stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah, it, that really shook things up there. I will say that the, the turtle is a sort of justification for the defending of the wall. I've been, I've been skeptical that they even need to defend the wall because the wall defends itself. In fact, defending the top of the wall just seems like a waste of time because no one's trying to climb it. They just need to defend the gate at the bottom. So they could be down at the bottom. But the turtle showed that you can get to the wall unmolested if you're clever. Sure. And once you're there, then attacking from the top of the wall is the way to go. I will say... I wonder if I was if I was them, the wildlings, that is, I might have designed the turtle slightly differently with a bit of more of a slopey roof. Oh, so maybe so the it barrel take would take a full impact. Exactly. If you if you make it sort of like a roof that it would slide down and not squish them like bugs underneath yeah. it. Yeah. Depending on how sturdy you make that roof, I guess. True, but not slanting it means that that impact is going to destroy the turtle. Yes, full impact on it. That being said, they only have eight barrels left. If they keep coming back and hiding under what's left of the turtle, they can start whittling away at that gate for sure. Yeah. So what you're thinking there is they would come in like the cover of darkness. Right. And work while while the brothers don't know that someone's in there. Exactly. Because. Exactly. Yeah. I could see that. Because I was thinking, they've got this destroyed turtle in front of the gate. Now the wildlings are going to have to clear that turtle out of the way to put a new turtle in place. I suspect but, it's not completely destroyed. My feeling is that it's like it was no longer safe to be under there, so they split. It was definitely damaged on at least one side. At least two barrels hit it. But I'm pretty sure that there's room for humans underneath there. And if a human can get underneath there, then the only thing that can get rid of that human is another barrel. And there are only yeah. eight barrels left. Right. Yes. Yeah. Eventually, eventually, with those eight barrels, they could probably crush the, the turtle. Possibly. To, yeah. You know, beyond yeah. repair. But, but until there, then. There must be an overhang. I mean, that, that it, the gate cannot be completely flush on the outside edge of that wall. So you can get under there, and then you're oh, pretty much safe. You know, true. You yes, you. That's true. Unless because they they repaired the wall, maybe they tried to seal it up just as flat true. as they could. True. But we don't know. No, we're just conjecturing yeah. now. Yeah. Um, I I will say the citizens of Moltown, Moltown, who previously have shown some steel. I mean, they came to defend Castle Black. Right. But they've surveyed the situation and they've hightailed it out of there. We'll be right back. Hello, friends. Are you ready to make some unforgettable memories? Well, if so, consider the Marriott Bonvoy program. Discover the perfect destination for your summer getaway and unlock exclusive deals on luxurious accommodations. With our affiliate partnership, you'll enjoy unbeatable savings and a seamless booking experience. Don't let summer slip away. Visit Marriott Bonvoy today and make this vacation season one for the books. Use our Ghosts of Heron Hall affiliate page to check it all out and buy Bonvoy points or give some as a gift. 
The link to our page is in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you can't blame them. No. But at the same time, I'm also not sure it's the wisest of moves. The best way to keep the wildlings out is to protect the gate. If the wildlings get through that gate, there's no safe place that they can reasonably reach these the, these moles from Mole Town. Especially with all the fighting going on in the north right now. Going too far south is going to get dangerous. It, it, and how do they know when, if they should ever come back? You know, if, they have, if they're waiting around not too far away, and tens of thousands of wildlings flood through the gates, into the gift, into the new gift, into the north, it's not going to... At some point, it's going to be problematic for them. Let me turn this back on you, McKelly. Okay? Okay. You look over your garden fence and you see an army of 100,000 coming your way. Do you try and defend your garden fence or do you start running? <laughs> if it's a garden fence, I run. If it was a <laughs> 700 foot tall fence, it might be different. But the, the other thing is the Molestown people are aware of how many Night's Watch there are. They didn't take a head count, but they looked around and they're yes. like, weighing the odds, we cannot win this battle. They're going to get through. Yeah, they were there for the fight against Steer and the other raiders, so they know how many Night's Watch are left at Castle Black. So that was probably the calculus that they they were factoring right. and, here. And assuming someone has seen the Wildling army and gone, whoa, that's a lot of people, and reported that back to Molestown. Yeah. Yeah. Or even okay. Zay herself. <laughs> Zay was like, yeah. where are you all? Do you want to come and fight at the wall? There's like a hundred thousand wildlings to aim at. <laughs> Maybe when he sent Zay to get them, and then uh, then he sent, I think it was Molly that went next and came right. back and said they're all gone. Maybe they were all there just doing their stuff. And Zay was like, run! Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> she just rode through town like the Pied Piper, taking them all yeah. with her. <laughs> Could have been that. It, it's really a shame because, as you said, you know, they fought and they fought valiantly yeah. when the uh, you know when the raiders attacked from the southern side of the wall. Of course, they had skin in the game at that point because they were on the southern side of the wall. They literally rolled rode through Molestown to get to Castle Black. But if they were here, if they were helping, you know, John mentions that there they don't, there's not enough people to replenish anything. There's no hands for fletching arrows. There's no people to gather boulders. Oh, any of the any of the replenishing things that yeah. that is really becoming a danger here. Yeah. So yeah, it's a shame because they really could be used. They'd be very helpful. I have a tip for the uh people of Castle Black is make peace with the wildlings. Invite them through in an orderly fashion. I've said it before. Yeah. I'll say it again. Yeah, I'll well, say it again until it maybe happens. <laughs> Speaking of the depleted force of the Night's Watch at Castle Black, John gets even worse news. A raven comes from the Shadow Tower that Bowen Marsh was injured in the fighting that we mentioned in the summary at the Bridge of Skulls, and that the garrison that he took with him all the way to the Shadow Tower and beyond won't be back anytime soon. And Bowen Marsh uh, left it pretty depleted. Like, we yeah. can we can discuss some of the numbers here, but he he left Castle Black almost unacceptably depleted. Well, talk me through the numbers. Come on, I mean you 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 threatened to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, so Mormont back in uh, Tyrion three of a Game of Thrones when Tyrion was still at the Wall, obviously. Mormont told Tyrion that there were 600 men at Castle Black okay. at that point. Right. Then he took 200 of the best men north of the Wall for the Great Ranging. He only took 200, not 300? He took 200 from Castle Black, 100 from the Shadow Tower. Okay, thank you. Then when John shows up after fleeing the uh, Steers uh, raiders, yeah, yeah. Noi tells John that there's about 40-ish men left at Castle Black. And that includes uh, like the dozen or so men that escaped the mutiny at Craster's 
and like the five ish or so uh-huh. of yeah, of Jarman yeah. Buckwell's scouts that went up into the frost fangs and and escaped with their lives. So Marsh must have taken around three hundred and sixty men on this wild goose chase ultimately chasing wildlings <laughs> here and there and everywhere and then he went and lost more than a hundred of them at the the battle at the bridge of skulls so yeah but that's, it gets worse that's useful math yeah if you think about it it gets worse because we don't have an official death count from the attack by steers raiders but right. we know more than a few brothers died so True. even if let's just say 15 of them died they could be down, down to, to his, 25. Yeah, like 25 men. And then right. we know Noy, Donald Noy, and the men that he took to defend the tunnel died. And Red Allen was hit by an arrow and fell off the wall. We learned that in this chapter. This so chapter, yeah. They, they could be down to less than 20 men guarding this wall against tens of thousands of wildlings. On some levels, the rearrival of Alistair Thorne and uh, a few men from Eastwatch is... Very convenient, but on yes. some levels, not so much. That's why John said, "I don't, I, I'm not dealing with all this. Just how many men did you bring?" You yeah, know? exactly. Yeah. They were yeah. like, uh, "Yeah, you're not getting out of this that easy." Yeah. And I will say that, you know, since John was kind of tapped as acting commander here at Castle Black, I it must mean that Jarman Buckwell something happened to him. Uh, maybe uh, he died during the uh, raider attack because. He was um, a pretty senior ranger in the uh, huh. Night's Watch. So you'd think he would be in command at this point. Um, so John spies on Mance's army with a Myrish glass that uh, Maester Eamon used to use. Uh, but basically, he's got a telescope on top of the wall. It's very yeah, cold and crystal pretty cool. clear. I would be very happy. Apart from the cold, <laughs> I'd be very happy. Uh, apart from the cold and the fighting and the danger and the yeah, and <laughs> the celibacy, arrows, I would be extremely miserable. <laughs> but I'd be happy with the telescope. So does the uh, the cold? You mentioned cold. Does that does it make for a clear night when it's cold? Typically, typically a cold night is usually clearer. Yeah. Okay. So. Good to know. One thing about the telescope, you know, John is kind of surveying the wildling force while he's looking through the telescope, and one thing he doesn't see is Mance Raider. And I just wonder what that's about. Possibly he just chose to sleep in. I don't know. Or maybe he's up to something because he sees, he sees Dala. I think he even sees Dala's sister Val. I believe he does. He sees, uh, he sees Torment Giants Bane and his sons. And I I think you mentioned in the summary, he sees um, Varamir Sixkins, but no Mance Raider. So that's a little bit, it could be weird or maybe, Maybe he's still sleeping. I don't know. <laughs> you know? I I didn't think of it. I assumed he was just in his tent. But yeah, maybe he is up to something. Yeah. That that it, would be a man's raider thing to do. Be up to something. Be up. That's what he does. He gets up mm-hmm. to stuff. John it, John uses the term. He's referring to the wildlings. He calls them whore's sons. And, um, you know, that's a pretty common derogatory term in Westeros. Yeah. We, we hear pretty... Fairly often throughout yep. the the story, but the use of it at that time might be possibly offensive to one of his brothers who's fighting on top of this wall here with him. Uh, which one, Pip? Satin. It, oh, Satin it says yes, that course, Satin yeah. was born and raised in a brothel, and that's not for certain that he's the son of a prostitute, but it's very possible. Typically, if you're born and raised in a brothel likely you're the child of a prostitute i'm just guessing that, that's that's what i'm thinking as well but we don't know for a fact at least i don't off the top of my head know for a fact uh, but you know maybe he just should just be a little more careful with his derogatory terms I, I, I'll, I'll take your point yeah words I'm words sure have meanings they carry weight it's probably kind of like calling someone an sob you know yeah. like the, the westerosi yeah. version if someone right. calls me an sob i don't literally think they're yeah. calling my but then again you weren't born in a brothel if you well, were, yes. you might take it a little <laughs> bit more personally. Might might feel different about it. Yes, mm-hmm. true. Um, as we mentioned, the, um, they had 12 barrels. They're down to just eight now. Uh, John rightly is worried about the fact they're going to run out of those. Uh, but as you said, given the numbers, there's no way to replenish all this stuff. Yeah, that, 
They just need some moles, really. Mm. The, the, but the good news is, and it's only very tiny sliver of good news, is that the wildlings don't know exactly how depleted true. their true, true, their true. ammo is, their stock yeah. of ammo. Um, John wishes that on top of the wall they'd built hoardings. And, and interestingly, I, I notice in the notes that you've looked this up, because I was not sure what he meant by hoardings either. But he means a temporary wall for safety. But I... Yes. Maybe I'm influenced by the TV show, but it felt like that the the wall had crenellations, you know. I thought, in my mind, I thought so too. It would be right. very weird if, if it didn't, wouldn't it? Like if it, you just accidentally take a wrong step and boom, there you go. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you're on top of the wall for a long period of time, you're going to play the sliding along game. And it would be <laughs> very exciting if there was no wall to protect you <laughs> yeah. from slipping off <laughs> the outer See? face. See how close you can slide to the exactly. edge without going <laughs> over. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I thought it might, I, it's, I did not look it up, but I thought it might mean a sort of like a an outward pointing platform that you might lie on and drop things. That's what I thought, based on context. That's what I right. envisioned as well. Yeah, but it's yeah. just a wall. Yeah, it it does seem like it would be the easiest thing to build is is ice crenellations. It would be freezing cold up there. A block of ice acts as a wall and you can peer right. around it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if it doesn't have crenellations, I'm a little bit surprised by that. Yeah. OSHA, uh, yeah, for safety purposes alone, OSHA would, uh, would flag them for <laughs> not having proper guardrails. Not, not OSHA the wildly. But... No, yes. <laughs> OSHA the uh, organization here in the United States that yes. keeps tabs on I, such things. I follow what you're getting at now, yeah. Um, so, John, uh, they, you know, they, they thwart the, um, the turtle attack, at least, at least the first turtle attack. There were no Teenage Mutant uh, turtles involved but uh, uh so john john's worn out and he decides he's not just gonna sleep in the warming shed like most of them have been he's actually going to go down in, to including his little... himself he's not lord yes. snowing it he, he also right. has been sleeping in the warming shed. yes the chapter started with him waking in that warming shed but he decides he's going to go down to his little room and, and on his way he's going to stop and get a glass of dream wine from Maester Eamon. And the dream wine has its intended effect. He does fall pretty much immediately to sleep. And while he's sleeping, he dreams of strange voices, shouts, cries, and a long single blast of a war horn. And to me, it seemed more like he was picking up on the reality around him. Because <laughs> yeah. he... as, as interpretation of dreams goes, this is just him <laughs> yeah. listening, right? Yes, because he wakes to find Thorn returned and uh, Slint has arrived and others from each watch, East Watch, which explains the strange voices. Yep. The shouts could be shouts of, hello, hey, there's uh, reserves are here. Or Thank it could God, be... you, you five have come to bolster our numbers by 20%. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or it could be shouts of those trying to prevent them from dragging John out of bed. That that did, uh, didn't seem like there were many people protecting John here. No, it really didn't. But and the the single horn blast signifies brothers returning from watch. Ah, good point. Yes. So I I think maybe he he just the dream wine kind of affected him a bit, and he was actually hearing reality and thought it was a dream. So it's a, it's all very good points. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted so, to mention that. Yeah, yeah. So in Mormont's chambers, uh, Janice Slint is acting as if he's been put in charge. But I, I actually didn't think of this. I'll, I'll give you credit here, Michaela. You put this in the notes. He hasn't even taken the black yet, as far as we know. As far and as yet, we know, right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, perhaps he did, but it seems strange. It seems strange to me that Alice Thorne would countenance that. I mean, put yourself in charge. You're Alice Thorne. You're you're one of the most senior members of the night. Certainly amongst the 25 remaining members of the Night's Watch, you're the most senior. Apart yes. from the guy sleeping by the fire, who you going to know? <laughs> you mean Sir Winton Stout. I do I mean Sir Winton Stout, yes. <laughs> or you, you could arm wrestle Maester Eamon for it if you want. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't get why Slint is being given so much respect and authority here. Who named him interim commander of Castle yeah. Black? I mean, literally, who had to die to put Jenna <laughs> Slint in charge? Everyone, and there are still 25 left. So. Tywin did send that letter 
to Bowen Marsh saying to pass along the fondest regards from the king to his faithful friend, Lord Jaina Slint. But it wasn't Marsh who put Slint in charge, as far as I know, because Marsh is not here. He's past the edge of the wall. Yeah, so, I, I uh, guess the one thing is that Thorn and Slint have traveled back together. And so yes, perhaps they right. formed a bond of some sort. And Thorn has seen that maybe Slint is someone that is good to hitch his wagon to. Let Slint take the take charge, but Thorn could be the power behind the throne sort of thing. I agree. I agree. I think yeah. that's probably what happened. But yeah. what's with this call me Lord, I'm the Lord of Harrenhal thing? Has no one told him yet that you... Have to give up your, yeah. which, your claims which goes to, land. to him not having taken his vows yet. <laughs> <laughs> Someone might want to let him know he's no longer Lord of Harrenhal. He's just a newbie on the wall. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to be Lord Commander, but I'm not taking the vows because I'm Lord of Harrenhal. Right. I I'm like that, that title too. much better. <laughs> no. uh, so this is the second chapter in a row where we've had a a, a trial going on. Oh, yeah, uh, that's right. Um, and I will say that Slint and Thorne's case... I'll say the case against Tyrion is very circumstantial, but the case against John is less circumstantial because almost every accusation they throw at him is true. It is. I think last chapter was Sansa, wasn't it? <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> very <laughs> well, very recently, we'll in say. In the recent past, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, no, you're absolutely funny, right. When you were saying though. that, I was like, that doesn't seem right. We've had... There was, there was that one that... I did, and then there was the one I didn't do, and then there was the trial. <laughs> the last one I remember was a trial. Right. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he's he's banged to rights here, John, because he did everything they're accusing him of. But yes. it's a matter of context, and just just as it was for Tyrion, that context is all all important. Like uh-huh. It instance, all depends on who's listening. Exactly. Tyrion threatening to kill Joffrey sort of thing doesn't look good when you've Joffrey has just died. Uh, right. Yes. The, you the, kill Corin Halfhand doesn't look good when uh well sorry, that's the end of that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't look good. <laughs> the the specific charges they lay against him are oath breaking, desertion, and cowardice, I believe. Huh. But I'm wondering, how did they get this particular bit of news? We're not we're not aware of any men being sent to Eastwatch since John has returned. Okay. Now, Jarman Buckwell reported John riding with wildlings freely when his scout, little scout group saw them. So maybe letters were sent to Eastwatch in the Shadow Tower before John got there. McKelly, are you forgetting, forgetting the presence of Rattleshirt in this scene? We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by Audible. To get a free audiobook or two if you're an Amazon Prime member, Go to our exclusive URL, audibletrial.com slash ghostsherrenhall. You can find the link in our show notes. Oh, yes, that's right. It's probably Rattleshirt. That, but he's a wildling. Who trusts that guy? <laughs> People who don't like John to begin yes. with. Yes. <laughs> well, that was going to be my third one. I wondered if they arrived just all happy-go-lucky. And then one of the people who thinks John is guilty, because John has mentioned while he's been there that some people are polite and positive to him and other people think that he's a, a traitor. I wondered if someone went, ran up to them and said, oh, hey, guess what? Jon Snow's back. He did all these terrible things. Yeah. But, yeah, uh, the rattle shirt one is probably the way to go. (laughs) (laughs) I'm with you. I can't think of any other way they would have found out. (laughs) Their prisoner who knew all this information, he looks like a pretty good source, particularly because during the scene, he blabs quite a bit of it himself. Yes, they bring him out and he describes what happened. When, when Cornhoff, there I go, Cornhoff on. Half on. When, uh, when Cornhoff hand was killed and John joined the wildlings, which is, like you said, it is not a great picture painted for no. John. Begging for his life, killing Cornhoff hand, riding with the wildlings, coupling with Egret. And what's funny about it is, of course, is that Donald Noy and Maester Eamon heard the exact same evidence. And drew the exact opposite conclusion. So it right. all depends on your perspective, basically. Yep. Yes, it does. Because because he never denied any of this. He always admitted to all of this. But the one thing that he he perhaps 
isn't very smart in admitting to here to Slint and Thorn is that he went beyond just sleeping with Ygritte. He admits yes. basically to falling in love with her. And that is clearly stretching Corin Halfhand's remit to you, where he says, do whatever you need to do. Yes. Like, fall in love with, with Ygritte, if need be. Yeah, yeah. That, that's his Ned Stark in him, you know? Yeah. yeah. He's got to be, he's got to honor Ygritte. He, he can't just... Uh, he thinks to himself, well, half of the brothers of Castle Black have gone to Molestown to dig, dig for buried treasure, but I can't compare Ygritte to Molestown prostitutes, so I've yeah. got to, you know, honor her here. I can't help but wonder if, if as Corin Halfman died in his arms, he was saying, so really anything? I mean, like, I could break all the vows? And, and, and I, like, see her over there, the cute one, can I? <laughs> the touched by fire over there? <laughs> yeah, touched by fire, exactly. <laughs> well, speaking of Rattleshirt, if you are wondering how Rattleshirt ended up as a prisoner of this crew... I am. The, the little bit of context we have is that Rattleshirt was spotted near uh, Long Barrow, which is just three castles over from Eastwatch, between Castle Black and Eastwatch, but on the Eastwatch side. Yeah, okay. So, and these men came from Eastwatch, so, right, right. you know, that, that there could be something to do with that whole situation there. I will say, while I'm snorting derision at John for blabbing to being in love with Ygritte, I will say, it literally didn't matter what he said. I mean, again, no. Donald Noy and Maester Raymond heard the same evidence and went, John, get on that wall, you're in charge. As right. Thorne and Janice Lint heard the same evidence, and no matter what he says, he was going to hang for it. Yeah, yeah. And, and Alistair Thorne tries to associate John killing Corn Halfhand to the mutiny at Craster's that killed uh, Mormont, and they and suggest that maybe the two are, you know, the, the two acts were part of one larger mutiny plot. Clever. Clever. Yes, it, it is. It is. It, it, we know it's nonsense, but it is a clever yes. accusation. Some men from Craster's escaped and could vouch for the mutiny plot just kind of unfolding at dinner like that, as it did. But the problem is they're all John's friends that that escaped and made it back to Castle Black. So I'm not sure how much uh how much consideration it would be given. And like you keep saying, it doesn't matter what he says or what anybody else says. They want to find him guilty. Yeah, yeah. Not even so, the respected Maester Eamon can talk them, can talk yeah. any sense into them. Yeah. So, so one thing that comes out loud and clear in this is Slint's grudge against Ned Stark, which extends to his bastard son, Jon Snow. Yeah. But it's a little it's... bit misplaced, right? It is. It's very much misplaced because Ned was dead. Ned thought he was making a deal with the Gold Cloaks to support him. Through Peter Baelish, right? Through Peter Baelish, yes. Right. And it was Peter Baelish that betrayed Ned. Ned never betrayed a Slint, to my knowledge, in my memory. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, if you think about it, Slint... Uh, maybe Slint is annoyed that he didn't get a bribe from Ned Stark. Perhaps this is what it is. It's like, oh, if he was a man yeah. of honor, he would have bribed me at least two thousand dragons to <laughs> That's bring right. the gold cloaks to his side. I guess yeah. it's possible that he actually believes what he was told that uh, Ned was a traitor who was trying to right. usurp the throne. Yes, with you to this point, but he must know who sent him to the wall. He. Tyrion, Tyrion told right, yeah. him. <laughs> it's not like... I, I mean, it's the Lannisters. The same people who killed Ned Stark are the people who betrayed Janice Slint. To, so he lost Harrenhal and lost his position as head of the Gold Cloaks and ended up on the wall. Yeah, and his small council seat to boot. Right, he was on the small council, yeah. I mean, everything, everything went against him and none uh, yeah. of it was Ned Stark. Right. Yes. <laughs> but I, I guess maybe he's just utilizing what he knows about Ned Stark to justify his actions towards Jon Snow, which have been sort of like set in motion by Alistair Thorne's opinion. Yeah, he's had he's probably had weeks, if not months, without probably months actually, with Alistair Thorne and hearing all these things about Jon Snow. And he also 
He wants, uh, Slint wants to be Lord Commander of Castle Black. Maybe he finds Jon Snow to be competition, being that Maybe, he is yeah. Ned Good Stark's point. son. Good point. Okay, uh, just before we go to background, there's going to be some spoiler chat just for our sustainers. That's right, for our, uh, let's see, our Royal Kingsguard and our newest, one of our newest Ooh. tiers, Small Council. I had to Ooh, think of what it was called for a second. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and and once you're on the small council, we won't send you to the wall, we promise. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, okay, so to background. Well, so for background, I'm just going to talk about Bowen Marsh and his trip to the Bridge of Skulls. So a- as we mentioned, Bowen Marsh led 300 brothers into the gorge to the Bridge of Skulls, where they did win a bloody battle but they lost 100 men in the process. So let's just look a little bit closer at this whole situation. So the Bridge of Skulls is located west of the Wall's westernmost point. It spans a gorge that the Milkwater, which is the river oh, yeah. way up here, we know the Milkwater. Um, seems to flow through out into the Bay of Ice. The bridge is near Westwatch by the Bridge, which is the westernmost castle of the Night's Watch, and... Hence the name of the castle, Westwatch by the Bridge, is near the Bridge of Skulls. So it With is so very, far. yes, very far out there. Very far out there. During the battle at the bridge, two of the brothers mentioned as having been killed were Sir Andrew Tarth and Sir Aladale Winch. Of course, we're all familiar with the Isle of Tarth through Brienne. Brienne. Although, and, yeah, Andrew's relationship to Brienne or her father Selwyn is unknown. So can't really give you much more on that one. Uh, Andrew took over for Alistair Thorne as the new recruit trainer when Thorne was sent to King's Landing with the White's Hand. Uh, so that's what we've got on Andrew Tarth. We really don't know much at all about Sir Aladale Winch. He was stationed at Castle Black before going on this wild goose chase with Bowen Marsh. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's an Iron Iron. I'm pretty sure he's an Iron Islander. As House Winch is an Ironborn house. Oh, good to know. So, comparison with the television show. So, there's not a lot to compare here. Thorn and Slint were already at Castle Black for the battles. And it's actually, I, I didn't say this at the time, but when John is left in charge on top of the wall, it is actually Thorn and Slint who leave him on charge in charge on top of the wall. Oh, okay. Um, I couldn't say that because they weren't at Castle Black then. So there would have been a spur right. for them arriving. Um, yes. They scarper when things get tough, and Slint actually bumps into another character, who I can't mention because it's a spoiler, when he goes into hiding in a storeroom at Castle Black when the fighting gets too fierce. Um, but none of the rest of it seems to really happen. I think it's coming in the TV show, but it's so far down the line in the TV show that I, I, I feared to tread much further forward than I went. Okay. Good but stuff. but but actually, I honestly don't know. I don't remember because I watched a bunch. I really watched a lot. But it feels like they can't interact. They can't coexist with him for any period of time and then throw the murder of Corin Halfand in his face. Right. It's, it's an instant thing or a never, you know? Yes, I'm with So you. I, I don't know how things are going to work out between him and Arsathorn, but not well would be my guess. <laughs> Pretty solid guess there. Yes. Uh, pedantry con i've got something it's been a while since i've actually come up with some pedantry but um let's hear it uh, alistair thorn scoffs i mean he scoffs at the idea that Mans raider was searching for the horn of winter in the frost right Banks. he mentioned something about did you count have to count the snarks as well or something exactly like that. he said do you also count the snarks that's what he says this man is just back from king's landing where he went with the still animate hand of a dead member of the Night's Watch. Right. Who, who, How far-fetched yes. are snarks and horns of winter? Right. If if whites are out there, what's to say that the other ones aren't exactly. as well? Exactly. <laughs> sure, if you want someone from King's Landing, you might say that, but you're Alice of Thorn. You know the dead come back to life. What yeah. do you not believe anymore? I guess maybe he's just doing it for, uh, you know, to to discredit John for yeah. Jaina Slint's sake. I guess. 
Right, so, because... so on, the, on the, the whole three months with Janice Slint, he never mentioned, you know what, that arm I brought down from the wall? <laughs> it was real. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Did it never come up? Like, so what were you doing in King's Landing anyway? Oh, I just had a bit of vacation time I had to burn. <laughs> <laughs> you have one too. Yeah, it's just, you know, the Battle of the Bridge of Skulls. Why even have a bridge west of the wall? It just seems like asking for trouble. Wait, when you say west of the wall, what do you mean exactly? I mean, the wall the wall runs out at the coast, doesn't it? Yeah, but then there's an area... Which sort where, of like bulges out. W- yes, with the where, where there's a But, but we are north of the wall. We're north of the wall, right? We're talking. I, it's, it's a little bit uh, complicated well, okay. to understand. John, is, when John is watching it, Jarl... It, let me ask you this. If yes. I were to walk from the Bridge of Skulls to Winterfell, would the wall be in my way? That's the question. I, <gasps> I think there's there's conflicting information here. When John is watching Jarl and... Uh, the rest scale the uh-huh. the wall before he and Egret go up over it. He's thinking about how on the east end of the wall, wildlings to get around it make get make boats and go right. you know around that way. On the west side of the wall, they pass through the gorge to get around the wall. So it certainly sounds like you can, according to that, you can get around huh. the wall by going through that gorge. And then they make it more convenient by putting a bridge there. It just like break up but, the if the bridge was there from ancient times, maybe just break it up or something. I see. So the gorge acts as a continuation of the wall in the sense that it's a it's an an east west running barrier. Right. So to get from the north side of it to the south side of it, you would have to cross the gorge. And it's yes. very steep. But there's That's how I understand it. Huh? There's a little bit of conflicting information about the gorge and whether or not exactly where it's located. Huh? But according to John, people get around the wall by going across the gorge. So, And the easiest route being the bridge. Yeah, the I bridge, think. you would think. I, which I, is I, why I, there was probably a castle called a castle called Westwatch by the bridge. Because they used to, must need to protect that bridge. <laughs> Where presumably, like, was passport and customs for the people going north and south of the wall. It's bizarre. Who would, who would be doing it? Why would you have a bridge? <laughs> I mean, like, honestly, if I was starting... So you start building the wall at Eastwatch, and you get all the way over here, and then you stop a couple of miles from the shore and build a bridge? It's like, <laughs> dude! <laughs> There's gotta be another way. we this, like, 600 feet tall if we're gonna have a bridge at this end? We ran out of ice. (laughs) (laughs) Miscalculated on that ice. (laughs) They only had enough to fill the gorge. So now people can just walk across. (laughs) Actually, that's it. The gorge used to be 700 feet deeper. (laughs) They filled it up with wall. (laughs) Well, that's uh, that's rock solid. I mean, that feels like a hole, you know, uh, not just a hole in the ground, but a hole in the whole geography. If the details are right, I'm basing it off of John saying that people use that gorge to get around the wall. Yeah, so. yeah. Do we have some news and notes? Uh, we certainly do. We have a, a lot of news and notes, actually. Uh, first thing we want to do is wish uh, our Jenny of Old Stones a happy birthday. Her birthday was yesterday. We're happy. We're recording today. Our listeners won't hear until next week. But as of this recording, Jenny's birthday was yesterday. So happy birthday, happy Jenny. Birthday, Jenny. Um, so you finally, sorry, we finally come up with uh, <laughs> <laughs> new sustainer tiers for our Buy Me A Coffee site. Why don't you describe them since you are the one who's done all the work here? Well, so we've added four new tiers and, and they they range in price and perks. Uh, with the uh, tier so hopefully there's something for everyone regarding your budget and your interest in interacting with us and uh, so, yeah you know, check out our buy me a coffee site for more details yeah and and one of my one of the cooler ones aside from the the spoiler talk which is pretty neat but one of the cooler perks that we've added and i think it's only available to our royal king's guard and our newest tier which our, our newest high tier which is a small small council, council. Exactly. Is send us 
your thoughts on future chapters. And, you know, if, if, if it works with what we're going to discuss, we will put it into our discussion and we'll credit you for it. Beautiful. So, yeah. Like that's that pretty one. neat. Yeah. Um, I'll so, buy me a coffee site. Just a reminder is buymeacoffee.com slash ghost Um, We have two new sustainers. Uh, Cole K has joined our night of the realm. I uh, took our advice and joined the tier just before we locked it and left a nice comment. I listen to the podcast every month when I'm on the road for work. I'm usually driving for about eight hours a day for a week each month. Ouch. Woo. And I'm all, almost caught up. Also, I've begun reading the actual books. You see, we're inspiring people. That's I've never right. been much of a reader with Percy Jackson being the last book series that I've read. So thank you for showing me just how awesome fantasy novels can be. Huh. Hey, look at That's us. That's really nice. Thank you, yeah. Cole. And we, uh, we also have a new sustainer carol the cupbearer of throne games has joined our recently added squire tier and uh carol the cupbearer of throne games said i want to say something nice but what i will ponder this question while i finally buy simon and michaeli a cup of coffee i promise not to poison the coffee i i believe i believe carol is a friend of mine if, if it's the same carol who's joined our discord server Oh, very cool. Yeah, so that's very nice of you, Carol. Thanks very much. I, I don't yes. know, but, but her references to coffee are a clue. Okay. <laughs> and and for her to struggle for something nice to say is unusual. <laughs> <laughs> Carol can usually fill a, fill a silence, let me tell you. But she's a very nice lady, and it's very nice to have her, so thank you. Yes, thank you both. Thank you, Cole. Thank you, Carol. We greatly appreciate your generosity and your support. And we have a new review from Jay Set on Podchaser.com. Uh, perfect podcast for anyone interested in anything A Song of Ice and Fire. No spoilers, excellent chapter summaries, insightful analysis, interesting background on characters, events, and places. These guys could teach a class on A Song of Ice and Fire. They're very impressive. Great way to oh, get through you. the story, picking up bits that might have been missed on a first read through. Well structured, I can't say enough good things. They obviously put a ton of effort into this. I've never left a review online for anything, but I created this account and I'm here to leave a review because I was feeling guilty that I get so much enjoyment from this podcast but haven't bothered to review you thanks simon and mckelly for enhancing my experience with the song of ice and fire wow all right thank you so much that is a great review it's gonna take me a couple of minutes to get over that one thank you <laughs> that's very very nice of you yes thank you so much all right let's conclude so john is in dire straits this is yes. very very bad his only friends are the rank and file night's watch brothers and they've got no power and a man so old that his power is way for thin. Yes, this is really, really not good. Yeah, I mean, There's... because they didn't say, we're going to imprison you until we decide what to do with you. They said, you're going to hang. Right. So it... You can't imagine they're going to say, but we'll give it four months so you can make a final appeal to the highest courts in the land. <laughs> right, yeah. There, there, seems, there doesn't seem to be a lot of outs for nope. John here. And nope. if they do it as quickly as they're talking about doing it, I it, it just doesn't yeah, it yeah. doesn't look good. There's two characters who've gone missing who might offer us some hope. One is Ghost. We still haven't seen him since he was let loose on the wrong side of the wall, of course. Yeah, I guess the problem there could be that Ghost is just waiting around like I can't get through the wall either. And now you put a turtle in front of it. I really can't get through. <laughs> so, Do you know about the bridge, Ghost? <laughs> yeah, I know, Maybe right? that's where he is. He's been running west all this time. Or he could be running east to get on a little boat, take it around the wall. <laughs> and the other missing character, I didn't even notice this one, really. I mean, is Mance. Yeah. Is Mance Raider going to do something? Has he got something up his sleeve? Yeah, was, it's just was the turtle weird. just a fake? Oh, right. Could be. Certainly drew their attention. Yeah. The Night's nice Watch brothers, that is. Yeah. And and just generally, like just ignoring John's plight, thinking about the plight of the wall, Slint and Thorn are not a great duo to have in charge at this time. Thorn at least no. understands the basics of the Night's Watch, the wall, the wildlings, and the threats that they face. Again, he took the animated hand with him to King's Landing. Right, Lending. right. But Slint is just a self-aggrandizing poppin' jay. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> good good term for him <laughs> yeah. and to have him in charge at this point is just a uh, 
strategic disaster. It, it couldn't really be worse. But I mean, yeah. both of them, it, even Alistair Thorne, who, yes, he's been around a while, but he left before the Great Ranging left. Yeah. He left for King's Landing after they, yeah. you know, after they got the hand. And, you know, that was before everyone left on the Great Ranging. So he has missed all that's happened. And he's coming back. He doesn't, he probably hasn't even seen the wildling force waiting on the other side of the wall here. He doesn't know what their res- what the Night's Watch resources are at Castle Black. He doesn't understand how dire the situation is becoming. Yeah, maybe that's why he didn't take the black. Maybe. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> this might be over quick enough. I'll come with you to Castle Black, but I want a head count when I get there before. <laughs> I want all the brothers to see me take my vows. <laughs> this is everyone. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm could be. Um, is there any hope for John? I mean, what what if the wildlings were to take the wall at this point? Would that help John? I think he might have burned a bridge there. Yeah, yeah, a bridge bigger than the uh, bridge of skulls, possibly. <laughs> <laughs> Maester Eamon somehow can f- spy us to free him. I mean, that's honestly John's best bet at this at yeah. this point. I think he's. Maester Eamon is as smart as anyone we've met in Westeros. If anybody can come up with a a way to at least delay this execution, hopefully it will be Maester Eamon. But again, they didn't seem to put much stock in anything he had to say. Yeah, yeah. So uh, next up, another of our favorite characters facing execution, uh, Tyrion Lannister. That's right. Yes, we, we get a conclusion to the trial and... Then we get a little something extra, and Ooh. you are definitely going to want to tune in uh, to see what that is. All right, there's four ways that you can help us. You could leave us a five-star review like Jay Set did. Um, you could buy merchandise at ghostofharrenhall.threadless.com. You could buy us a cup of Arbor Gold at buymeacoffee.com slash ghostharrenhall or become a sustainer at any of the new levels that are available. They're all, uh, they all have good perks. There's something for everyone. So if you could join in, that would be fantastic. Or you could donate directly to our cause through our website, ghostofharrenhall.buzzsprout.com. And if you're looking for more ways to interact with us, keeping up on the latest Ghost of Heron Hall news and developments... You can check us out on our social media and follow us on Twitter at Ghost Heron Hall. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Discord, and YouTube. Thank you for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.